ought to quit while I'm ahead, really, oughtn't I? It sounds a great CV. Uh, uh, I don't quite recognise all of it. Anyway, thank you uh, for the words, John, and, and thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, been an interesting couple of years for me and, and obviously a very interesting couple of years for, for the industry. Uh, a few of the points that I want to make um, do chime with Ocker's, so I'll try and kind of skip through the things where we say the same thing and maybe focus on the, on the areas where we might say things slightly differently. Um, so when I wrote this uh, a few months back and I thought, well, we, we all like to focus on the issues and what we're going to do about them, uh, I didn't really anticipate we'd have quite as uh, difficult a market as we have. Um, so I'm more about why has it happened, uh, what are we going to do about it, and I thought it gave me an opportunity. I, I've in the past always spoken exclusively representing a British business, so uh, I'm talking about an Anglo-Irish business and maybe an opportunity to put some myths to rest uh, about what goes on, what it does, and hopefully at the end of it you'll agree that it's a more positive than negative influence on what's going to happen in our industry. So a little bit about the history for those of you that, that don't know about it. Um, uh, Adams has been in the British market a long time, over 30 years, uh, and of course its origins were very much uh, based upon Britain needing to be a net importer. We weren't self-sufficient. We needed to import products to supply our markets, and Ireland was the obvious place to do it. It is the diametric opposite. It's a large production market. Not many Irish people there, and therefore is always rather like Denmark, had to go looking for markets overseas. It's a committed owner. Uh, it's not always for the faint-hearted, the British market, so you can see various transactions over the years. But just look at the last five years uh, where the Irish Dairy Board, which ultimately behind it is Pharma Cooperatives, uh, has invested over £60 million in the market here. So today, uh, we are number two to Arla, so it's um, particularly interesting for me, obviously, seeing both sides of the parish. Uh, very clearly, the number two cheddar supplier. Uh, we actually sell more British cheese than Irish cheese, so there's the first myth, maybe, to put to rest. So we have more than just a passing vested interest in the good health of the British cheese market. Uh, we've got sales of over £400 million and we sell over 100,000 tonnes of products. So we're a big player. Maybe we don't position ourselves enough as that. Uh, our brand Pilgrim's Choice is the very clear number two, and our brand uh, Kerrygold in Butter uh, prides itself on a premium positioning uh, with over £20 million of sales. Uh, anyway, enough of the advertorial. I might, might come back to that a little bit later, but let, let, let's talk about the, the wider market. Uh, I must have put a roller coaster slide up uh, in about every presentation I've, uh, uh, I've ever made about the dairy market. Um, it's much more fun when the roller coaster is obviously going in a northerly direction. But I suppose what's different this time around is the speed and level uh, that prices have tumbled. So the fact that we've seen volatility is not unusual. Uh, when I was promoting the merger with, um, with Arla uh, two and a half years ago, we recognised there might be greater volatility, but I... I very much recognise one of the slides that Ocker put in that said our average return, we believed, would be better than it had been historically. Uh, and for the record, uh, I still believe that's the case. So what's been going on? I'm going to skip through these because Ocker's covered them very well. The supply side's got ahead of the demand side, all three of the major exporting regions. Uh, we were encouraging growth. Let's not forget that the price... And, and how we all behave, recruiting farmers, encouraging investment, is encouraging growth. We needed growth. It's just perhaps come on too quickly, uh, and at the same time, uh, demand has gone decidedly sluggish. Um, and this button should have created the next slide. Um, and uh, the world market's well discussed, but Europe, which we do still rely very heavily on Europe, all of the businesses that have been uh, mentioned, our core consumer markets remain Europe. And Europe, I've shown it there with a hot air balloon without a lot of air in. Um, you know, what's been happening in, in Euroland over the last few years, of course, has had effect on demand. Whilst we're in mature markets, there's still opportunities for growth. We still believe we can uh, persuade consumers in certain parts of Europe uh, to have more dairy and more value-added dairy in their diets. When they're feeling under economic pressure, of course, that affects their behaviour. 
So, of course, what unfortunately happens in markets is um, they perhaps overcorrect um, and perhaps have overcorrected on the way up uh, and now are overcorrecting on the way down. And again, uh, I recognize the, the milk model uh, Ocker talked about, where the problem with the overcorrection on the way up is the effect it has on prices and potentially the effect it has on demand. And maybe there's some things we can learn from that, particularly in the consumer markets, which don't respond uh, very favorably to yo-yo pricing. So we, what has changed, certainly in the time that I was at MilkLink, we were never looking at graphs like this. Uh, this is showing the growth of the UK milk supply. If we got any growth, we were slapping ourselves on the back. Uh, so to see over a billion litres of growth, really, we haven't seen anything like this, uh, certainly in my time in the industry. So we'd been encouraging it. We wanted it. Unfortunately, it's come at a time... Uh, when other markets around Europe and around the world have grown. Uh, and again, as, as has been previously said, it's what we do with that milk, finding markets for it and ideally finding value-added markets and markets that don't just move uh, up and down with the commodity value of milk. And I suppose uh, wearing my cheese hat now, wearing my British cheese hat, a worry, uh, and maybe if we're really honest with ourselves, something we could have done a better job on, uh, is how much of that extra milk found its way into cheese and found its way into table cheese, maturing cheese. So the stocks have never been higher. As I'll go on to say at the moment, demand's not, uh, uh, not in the pink of health. And of course, that inevitably puts pressure on prices. Uh, and I used to spend many, many hours every month looking at the supply and demand balance. Uh, and maybe collectively as an industry, we could have done a better job. Yes, the milk's got to be turned into something, uh, but not necessarily lots of extra table cheese that, that doesn't actually have a market uh, at the moment. So no surprise with all of that going on. And again, we all know uh, what's happened to milk returns. What I've done here that I thought was just interesting to shine a light on uh, is track Ampi versus McV, so McV uh, milk cheddar value equivalent. Uh, and look interestingly what happened last time we had a bit of a slump in 2012. McV was more resilient, and just maybe the learning is we did a better job that time around in terms of managing the stock balance. So I think there's both a, a, a stock management lesson here, uh, but also demand, as I'll go on to say, uh, we have to do better in terms of not just keeping demand up, but, but getting it back into growth. So we know what's happened to farm gate milk prices, uh, and the level of drop um, is more than certainly I've ever seen in my time in the industry. Uh, and whilst I uh, stood and sat at conferences a couple of years ago where we were uh, suggesting we might see more price volatility, you might need to put more into reserves, um, Co-ops traditionally, their job is to pass whatever value they get back to farmers, let them make the decision, do they want to hold it, invest it. Um, but I don't think we could have prepared anybody for the level of price drop. Uh, even since I wrote this slide talking about um, 10p drops, we know in some cases it's gone even further than that. And that for a million litre farmer, that's £100,000 a year impact on his income. Very difficult to do uh, what uh, is required in terms of costs and recover that, al almost mission impossible. So for me, the other essence uh, of this is, is, so at one end, there's a what do we create in terms of value, but of course, how we distribute it. Uh, and in one sense, a co-op in its purest form is there to distribute all the value net of costs that it, pro, uh, that it uh, generates through the chain. Uh, private companies uh, and the private company that I own down in Devon, that's a choice. You have a choice of how much of the value you've created you choose to pass and you either take a longer term view of wanting your farmers to stay in business and be around or you take a shorter term view and you take whatever you can off them because the opportunity presents itself. So with all of that going on, um, I think we'd all be uh, keeping pretty busy if that was it. But I think in parallel, uh, I think we're seeing the biggest change in the uh, retail food scene that, again, I've seen in my 30 years in the industry. Uh, I describe it as a paradigm shift. In other words, things are changing and they won't go back to where they were. Uh, the other expression I use in our business 
is that we've gone through an easy jet moment. We'll all remember 15, 20 years ago, we used to go to a travel agent and perhaps fly with a national flag carrier, and we're all now paying an awful lot less to fly around Europe than we did even 15 years ago. Unfortunately for basic foods, I think that's what's going on here. And it's not just about um, the price of the discounters, which we all um, uh, see a lot of uh, commentary about. I think it's also about pricing integrity, about consumers becoming more savvy uh, and you don't just shop in Aldi because you're poor, maybe you shop in Aldi for part of your products because you're savvy uh, and you still go to Waitrose or somewhere else uh, for the things that you can't get at Aldi. And I think that puts a pressure on everybody in the industry, my part, uh, the processing, but retailers, to improve their level of price, honesty and integrity. So the bottle of wine uh, that was half price uh, at five quid, maybe it was never really worth ten quid in the first place. Uh, and consumers perhaps are waking up uh, to some of those um, perhaps misleading price messages. Again, the next slide, lots of talk about what's been happening with Aldi and Lidl. Less talk, look at how resilient M&S has been. Um, Waitrose perhaps get a bit more publicity. M&S, this often gets wrapped up in their overall trading, which has been uh, difficult for them on the non-food side, but their food uh, is proving to be remarkably resilient. The other one that caught my eye on this slide is the independents, who've been receding market share for many, many years. Good, well-run uh, independents starting to see some growth, and what I call the squeezed middle, uh, particularly of the, of the big uh, uh, four, seeing market share declines, and this is just something they uh, have not been used to, having seen uh, decades where they've been taking market share from everybody else. Uh, their response, uh, this slide, is sort of out of date already, really. I mean, this has been the noise of the last 18, 24 months. And for me, as a consumer, just too much price noise uh, and walking up and down the aisles and half price, buy one, get one free, this is lower, this is rollback. Uh, and I think what's starting to emerge now is something that's a bit more refined uh, about how retailers offer real value rather than just the perceived value of a buy one, get one free that was just a one that was heavily overpriced. Uh, and I, for one, would be glad to see it come to an end. It, it totally distorts uh, the supply chain uh, in terms of how much product is bought, why it's bought, uh, and I would like to think out of this we'll get better pricing integrity and transparency, uh, much more efficient supply chain, uh, and perhaps uh, some products that have been on the shelf simply because uh, they were there to do a buy one, get one free, don't really deserve that place uh, 52 weeks a year. So we're having to cope with something that's new uh, in, in, in my career, uh, something called food price deflation. So we've often had volatility in the food supply chain, but we in the past have always managed to put enough value added in to compensate for anything that was going the other way. That appears to have gone, uh, and for the first time since uh, food uh, inflation uh, records were kept, we're actually going backwards, uh, and I'm afraid dairy uh, is, is a significant component of that. Uh, it's a big sector, and if you add all the parts of dairy, so all the great things we do in terms of adding value, plus all of the negatives that are happening in terms of pricing, uh, there's less coming in at the one end. And of course, that creates um, massive challenges uh, for all of us uh, to get a sustainable level of profit all the way through the supply chain. And of course, what's happened in the retail price of milk uh, has taken a lot of profitability out for retailers and processors, uh, not just uh, the farm uh, gate level of the supply chain. So one thing that concerns me uh, as a cheese man, I've always, to be honest, had the most affinity with cheese out of all of the dairy products. Uh, we eat cheese, most of us in this room will eat cheese primarily because it tastes fantastic and it's very versatile. For you, uh, as dairy farmers, the, the other important thing is it's the second biggest user of milk. So liquid milk uh, is, is the uh, biggest user, but, but about 25% of milk ends up in cheese. I've tried to, to, to paint a little more uh, uh, information on this. So 
uh, agreeing with, 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 with the earlier slide that the cheese market is down. What, what, what's most concerning for me is what we call everyday, so this is largely cheddar or cheddar type products. So really versatile, universal distribution, every home in the land will have cheddar or something similar. Going backwards, this is volume, uh, value would be even worse, 3% at a time when we've had record uh, milk supply and record production. So you can see why that market is under pressure. And we've seen spot prices in this area fall by over a thousand pounds a ton. And that happens when you've got a market out of balance and, and uh, demand uh, down as, as this slide shows. On a more positive note, uh, the, the bubbles on the right, which is somewhat smaller, but higher added value, what we call speciality, and uh, favourite ingredients, so this is some positive effect of all of the various cookery programmes that we get uh, bombarded with. Uh, consumers are starting to respond to that, but, but, but not enough. So what's going on in cheddar in particular? Again, I think this is a bit of look ourselves in the mirror as an industry. On the way up, maybe we've overpriced this. I felt that when... Uh, Branded cheddar got to five pounds for a block that, by the way, had got smaller at the same time. We always used to sell the standard size was 400 gram. So it went down to 350. The retail price went up to 500, uh, uh, five pounds and consumers thought there seems to be a bit more plastic and a bit less cheese. Look at what was happening to other versatile proteins like chicken. I do feel we overpriced our product. I think certain elements in the supply chain took too much. So it wasn't just a, a factor of milk price. And of course, it's always much harder to wrestle back a market when you've lost some of it than it is to keep it growing in the first place. But wrestle back, we absolutely uh, must do. I think the high-low promotions have been very damaging. They just move volume around. They don't seem to add very much. Uh, and I think brands, uh, of which the business I'm representing has one, there are others, uh, as again you saw on an earlier slide, really, really important that the brands do their job. Because if we track how this market behaves, uh, I describe it as behaving like a seesaw. So the red line on this slide is the percentage of the market taken by private label. Private label is important. Retailers uh, like to use it. It's their point of difference. But the blue line is the total market. And our view is that when private label is overexposed, overranged, overpromoted, the market suffers. Uh, and, of course, we can see from the total uh, numbers I shared with you a moment ago uh, that the market has been going in the wrong direction. Why do we think that is? Uh, well, actually, there are, for some consumers, they only buy brands. Uh, and uh, you might notice this in your fridges at home. For certain sectors, consumers are quite schizophrenic. For certain sectors, they might be very relaxed about buying own label. For other sectors... They've got, they, they like a brand, it gives them consistency, they have some other emotional affinity to it. So in this category, our research tells us that about a third of consumers will only buy a brand. So if their brand of choice isn't there, uh, then they might just walk by or go to another supermarket that might have it. About a third buy both and about a third only buy private label. And the job of brands is much more than just being on the shelf and, 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 and peddling price. Brands are there to build positions, to add value, to innovate. Uh, and it's worrying that collectively brands in Cheddar have been reducing their level of investment uh, right at a time when maybe we need to do uh, the opposite. And I think it's, it's um, interesting to contrast what's happened in um, Cheddar with, with what's been happening in butter. Uh, and as a butter man my entire life, uh, we, never, we never had margarine on our table. We've been battling this for decades, um, the butter versus uh, margarine uh, uh, debate. Uh, overall, the, the sector they both operate in we call yellow fats, or I think it was shown as BSM, uh, butter spreads and margarine. The sector's been declining, but we've been seeing now for the last few years butter in growth. Uh, it was great, that's, that's a copy of the front cover of Time, uh, saying we should eat butter, and actually the quote, you probably can't read it, says, scientists labelled butter the enemy, why were they wrong? Uh, I suspect everybody in this room has known for some years that, that you know, the natural qualities of butter, uh, but also there's nothing beats the taste. Um, but I think the, the, the important thing in comparing it to cheddar is this is a market of the brands. Uh, there are four strong brands, 
two from the previous speaker's company, uh, uh, one from DC and one from R Stable. Private label has a pretty uh, small share in comparison to Cheddar. The brands are strong, the brands are well supported, the brands have been innovating. You know, the spreadable products that are out there now have transformed the market and more recent developments of, of quite sophisticated cooking variants shows what can be done in what appears to be, you know, a stable, rather dull market. Um, so why can't we do uh, equally as well in the cheddar market? So what does this all mean uh, for the industry we all um, rely on for our, our, our livings? Well, this issue of volatility isn't going to go away. It's how we deal with it, uh, not just on farm, but how we as processors deal with it. Um, Co-ops deal with it in a particular way. Private businesses can choose to deal with it in, in a different way. So let's not be surprised um, when it comes back again. At the moment, the direction of travel is south, but... Uh, uh, if history repeats itself, then it's going to flick round again and we're going to be potentially seeing uh, the other part of volatility uh, maybe towards the end of the year, uh, next year. We don't want to repeat some of the mistakes uh, that I think we might have made in the last uh, boom. Um, I think we have to readdress this subject of, of exports. It's been, again, on pretty well every agenda at every conference I've ever spoken at. We'll lamentably rubbish at it, to be really uh, harsh on ourselves. Um, and I think the infrastructure that other organisations have put in place, and thank goodness now we have uh, a co-op like Arla that can get round the world, but what products is it going to be putting round the world? We'd like to think it's a bit more than skim milk powder and commodity butter, that there are fantastic products here that surely can find audiences uh, around the world. And I will keep coming back to it that we, we should not forget and need to get our own domestic market growing again uh, in order to provide uh, a market for a growing milk supply. So I'm going to now say a little bit uh, about what uh, our owners, the Irish Dairy Board, has done about exports, if only to serve as an illustration of some of the uh, things that need to be done um, uh, partly by, you know, we have a role to play here, but also by other businesses. If you really want to build uh, a value-added international business, it takes time, money, uh, and effort. And for the reasons I said earlier, Ireland's always been outward-facing, uh, rather like Denmark and Holland. Uh, they've been at this for a long time, uh, over 50 years, in fact. So uh, Ireland is actually still, um, as a processing industry, heavily fragmented. There's lots of co-ops. It hasn't come together as a single body uh, a, a, of a co-op as, uh, as in Denmark, but at least they work together in the international sphere. So in effect, the Irish Dairy Board largely control the international markets outside of uh, Ireland. I say largely, uh, some of the members still like to do a bit of their own thing. So it's a sizable business, uh, two billion pounds worth of sales, 3,000 staff. And of course, with quotas coming off, um, the strategy of how much are we going to grow, what markets, what capacity do we need. Uh, that uh, intensive period of planning has been going on for, uh, for about three or four years now. Uh, this number you will uh, recognise. Uh, one of the earlier speakers said maybe it won't come on in quite uh, the fashion expected. Maybe not. Uh, maybe it'll be a bit lumpy. But in terms of preparing for growth, where's the capacity? What products is it going to go into? Where are the markets? Um, there's been an awful lot of planning and investment to get ready for that. I'll say it on a public platform for the avoidance of doubt. It's not the intention to go and dump another 80, 100, 1,000 tonnes of cheese onto the British market. Uh, Adams, having a foot in both camps, has a very vested interest in making sure the market here uh, 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 progresses and is a value-added market, and oversupplying it isn't exactly going to do that job. In fact... I think Ireland's been very responsible in terms of reducing the level of imports at a time when clearly domestic production has kicked on. Uh, so we have to find places around the world. Uh, the Irish Dairy Board have invested over 200 million euros, uh, getting themselves ready for growth, either in processing capacity, branded development, buying businesses in markets to allow for market access. Uh, and the primary focus on that to, is not just selling commodity products, but is to try and leverage the brands that they have, uh, the most uh, recognisable of which is Kerrygold. So to either leverage that brand across different categories where they already are in a, in a country, 
to take it into new geographies or indeed to take it into some new categories. Uh, and a good, good illustration of this, as you, again you saw from an earlier slide, Germany remains the biggest milk producing uh, nation in Europe and yet Ireland have managed to develop a branded value added 50,000 tonne butter business in Germany. But that's taken many, many years to do. The price doesn't just oscillate as the commodity value of butter does and I really would love to see uh, more of the great British products that we uh, produce here uh, being sold into international markets. New product development, this is what brands are supposed to do here and abroad. So taking a brand uh, that's working in a category, trying to leverage into new categories. I have to say, when I saw that we were launching into the cream liqueur market, I thought, blimey, that's racy. That might be um, uh, a brand extension too far. But the Kerrygold brand was launched into cream liqueur as a branded competitor to Bailey's in the States uh, and is performing very well. So it shows what can be done if you put the resources and show the commitment. Uh, and looking around the world, um, as I said earlier, the Irish Dairy Board is in, in 100 countries, uh, 3,000 people, uh, 2 billion of sales, but it takes feet on the ground. Uh, I used to say in MilkLink when I used to get asked about what about our exports, I used to say it needs more than a guy with a samples bag with a round-the-world air ticket uh, in order to build a real export business. Uh, I think businesses like Arla, businesses like uh, the Irish Dairy Board have put the hard yards in. And again, for the record, we do actually sell British cheese through this network. We have a brand called Londoner that we sell in the, sell in the States alongside our Irish brands. So we are uh, involved in this and, and doing uh, our bit uh, to help British... Uh, dairy sales overseas. And of course, we, we have a big role to play in the UK market, particularly in cheese. As I said earlier, we are the number two. We have a brand, okay, that only uses a small amount of British cheese, uh, but we have a very big private label business, uh, more than half of our business in private label. Uh, and we've got three key areas of focus in order to develop uh, the cheese category. Uh, and we're certainly coming out fighting on all three. I'll say more about the brands in a moment, but how we work with our uh, own label customers. We are Tesco's biggest uh, cheese supplier. Um, Tesco has got its challenges, but I think it is and will remain the biggest retailer. So if you want to get the cheese category uh, performing, you better get it performing in Tesco. And we have an awful lot of work going on at the moment. Uh, you'll see from the Tesco cheese fixture over the last few years, much more of it is British. It's very clearly labelled, goes way beyond um, what was being asked for in country of origin labelling. So really, uh, primary field of vision uh, and where consumers want to make those choices, we're giving them the ability to do so. Um, our own brand is important to us. Uh, we're putting our money where our mouth is. We'll be investing over £3 million this year. We've got some fancy new packaging and some very edgy new advertising. I'm not going to share that with you now, but you'll notice it if it's, it passes the test of being disruptive uh, and stand out, uh, and that'll be on air shortly. Uh, and our Kerrygold brand, again, putting our money where our mouth is, £2 million of investment this year, keeping its premium position, positioning we don't want to be in the bargain basement uh, uh, discount arena. And particularly important for our British cheese agenda is our, our customer brand agenda. Uh, we're working with our retailers to try and get consumers to broaden their repertoire. We're doing some very interesting work with Tesco at the moment, completely relaying uh, how, how consumers shop the fixture. And probably what needs to happen in this category, like many others, is less equals more. There's lots of range proliferation that doesn't necessarily give choice, certainly adds cost. And I think we've got to find the right balance of what's the right number of SKUs to get the, the category working at its uh, optimum. Uh, and obviously, we work with a number of major cheese suppliers. Um, uh, First Milk's had a lot of mentions uh, this morning. Uh, again, for the avoidance of doubt, what we do with them delivers a market competitive milk price uh, for the cheese that we buy. What then that translates with their other activities for their member price, uh, we, can't, um, we can't affect. Uh, we're obviously watching developments with great interest, but I think our supply partnership is part of uh, the recovery strategy, not part of the problem. 
Elsewhere, we've done some very innovative work with Parkham down in my neck of the woods uh, in, in Devon, and we work with uh, smaller value-added businesses like Belton, finding a, a route uh, to market for their uh, excellent uh, and well-differentiated cheeses. Uh, and we need to all, I think, uh, up our uh, effort in terms of if we want consumers to pay more, you have to give them more, either give them more in terms of uh, quality, um, differentiation, uh, packaging, formats. Uh, we think there's big opportunities in meal solutions. Look at how successful uh, M&S have been of making it easy for consumers to put together a meal for good value, excellent quality, and cheese should be a hero part of a lot of those recipes, but we have to provide it in the right format for consumers to be able to do that. I've been a great fan of lighter cheddar for, for, for the last 10 years. I really don't think we've done the job on that yet. Uh, for consumers concerned about calories and fat, it should be the semi-skim milk of the cheddar market. We've now got great products uh, that consumers wouldn't actually know they were lower in fat. The market share that these take is still far too small, uh, in my view. So in summary, um, uh, I can't promise you it'll suddenly all get better uh, uh, quickly, but I think the long-term um, trends are still positive. Uh, consumers love our products. I think the day we forget that uh, is the day we have really uh, lost the plot. The, the primary reason people uh, buy dairy is because it tastes fantastic, whether it be nice chocolate milk that I make down in, in Crediton or excellent uh, extra-mature cheddar or fantastic spreadable butter. Uh, people like the naturalness, they like where it comes from, but first and foremost, they think it tastes great. Uh, I think we've got to up our game. We must play a bigger agenda. Uh, I think the example was used, uh, I think Jaguar Land Rover got a mention to it when we were talking about great brands. My son actually works for that company. And uh, what a great example of, of booming sales, lots of investment going in, and it's largely uh, international growth that's driving that. Um, I felt uh, back in my milk link days, we had some really wonderful products. We just didn't have the route to market. Uh, perhaps that's now open to us. But let's not forget, you know, this is a massive market. The 63 million people live here. We are the fifth wealthiest nation in the land, so we should be able to persuade people to pay a higher price for their dairy product, but we have to earn it. Um, we have to give them something uh, that they value if they're going to part with more of their hard-earned cash. And uh, to reassure you, uh, for our part, Adams is very committed to the British dairy scene and will certainly be playing our part uh, in, to see the market recover from this and prosper. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>